Welcome to NCCP Anywhere. I'm Pastor Melissa Rudolph, and this month we're going to be looking at an interesting topic, and that is how we translate some of the words originally from Biblical Greek into what we understand the scriptures to say to us today. But before we go too far into our series, it's Greek to me. Open with me in prayer, if you would. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We pray that your spirit will draw us closer to you and that you will open our ears and our minds and our hearts to the word you have for each and every one of us today. And as I, your servant, stand before you, I pray that I would decrease, that you would increase. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. When one of my sons was really small and I had trouble putting him to bed one night, I remember we were lying there and we thought it would be fun and a little bit boring to try to come up with a game of listing things in categories. And one of the categories we chose was languages. So we started naming as many as we could, English, French, Spanish, Hebrew, Greek, on and on and on. I think we got to maybe 50 different languages before he had just fallen asleep. But the truth is, we hardly scratch the surface. In the world today, there are more than 7,000 languages that are spoken. And then, when you take it even further down, the scriptures in their totality have only been translated into 704 languages. That may have changed since 2020. Maybe translators got bored during the pandemic and had a little more time on their hands. But there are people all over the world still trying to translate the word of God for it to be understood. And we're barely scratching the surface. An additional 1,500 different languages can be used to read the New Testament. So we're still working through that. But what we get frustrated with sometimes, even in reading the Bible in today's English, is that when we look at different translations, sometimes the words can be seemingly really unrelatable. We wonder, why is it that this word is used in this translation of the Bible and this word is used in another translation? Well, it goes back to the fact that there are just not enough ways in English sometimes to describe with one word all of the different nuances of a text. So we're going to be looking at some of the commonly used words we find in scripture where we find some variation. And we're going to go back to what it says in biblical Greek. Now, all the way back in Jesus' time, people spoke several different languages, um, but a lot of the scriptures were originally in Hebrew for the Old Testament, and then the New Testament scriptures were written in Koine Greek. Koine was a really commonly used language, so it wasn't the highest level of speaking. It was what people could understand. So think about that. What God wanted as, as the word was being revealed to people was for it to be understandable. So then, as the Roman Empire began to expand and people began to take these scriptures to other places in the world, they were using the fact that there were common languages around to be able to spread the good news. Latin and Greek were commonly spoken by most of the people in the Roman Empire. But by the Middle Ages, very few Roman citizens held on to that knowledge of Greek. Latin is the one that began to rule the day. And so as monks were starting to translate the scriptures, they, were, they would copy them by hand. And they got to the places where they might get a book that was written entirely in Greek. And they would put a little note on the outside of it and pass it along. And this is what the note would say, Greekum est non legitur. And that meant this is Greek, it can't be read. And they would pass that scripture along. So over time, the word Greek became a way to say it's something that's hard to understand. 
And even, even William Shakespeare used the phrase, the idiom, it's Greek to me, in Julius Caesar, because it had become a common way to express things that were just hard to understand and were hard to translate. Well, we know now, as more scholars have unlocked what biblical Greek texts included and, and, and we learn more about it, this month we're going to be looking at a few of them. And today we're going to start with the word life. Now I want you to think about all the different ways we use the word life. We think about the serial life, the game of life. I think about when someone will say, let me live my life. Or to even think about life as being that force that's inside of all of us. We just have one word for that, life. Well, in Greek, there are actually three different words for life. And we're going to take a quick look at those before we get into our text today. The three Greek words for life are bios, shuka, and zoe. Now, we've heard those in different places before. Think about bios is kind of like biology. And then shuka is like psych, like psychology. And then zoe, we often use as a common name for girls, zoe. So here is um, the way that those are broken down in scripture. When we look at the word bios, we think of life like in Luke chapter 8, verse 14. And that which fell into the thorns, these are those who heard and going away are utterly choked by anxieties and riches and pleasures of this life and do not bring any fruit to maturity. That's the parable of the sower. But again, it's talking about life as if, as if something can grow like a plant. That's the word here. It's that physical body. So it's the English word. So think about bios like biology, that English word uh, and what it means. And then the next way we see it is shuka. The Greek word translated here is soul life. And we see that in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. For whoever wants to save his soul life shall lose it. But whoever loses his soul life for my sake shall find it. That's a passage that we commonly will use during a, a funeral. And sometimes when we think about life in that terms, we often are thinking about the physical life of the person who has passed away. But what we can see here is what's meant is actually the soul, the soul life that we all have. And that's why it's important to think about. It's this break between not just our physical bodies, but our soul and our psyche. So then the last way that we see life lived out in scripture is through the Greek word zoa. And that is found in John chapter 1, the beginning of that gospel. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So zoa refers to this uncreated, eternal life of God, the divine life that is uniquely possessed by God. So keep that in mind as we look at our scripture today. Because in this passage, we're in John chapter 6, verses 24 through 35. This is a part of the scripture that happens right after Jesus feeds the 5,000. He's fed 5,000 people miraculously. The disciples get into a boat and go across to the other side of the sea. And then Jesus comes to meet with them. And, and this is where he's walking on water. And he, everybody is wondering how it is that, that Jesus got there to be with them. And they're looking for him. And, and all of the crowds are starting to try to find Jesus again. And he's saying, you're looking for me because I fed you. You're thinking about me with your bellies. But he says, I assure you that you're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate all the food you wanted. Don't work for food that doesn't last, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the human one will give you. God the Father has confirmed him as his agent to give life. They asked, what must we do in order to accomplish what God requires? And Jesus replied, this is what God requires, that you believe in him who God sent. 
And they asked, what miraculous sign will you do? What then can we see and believe in you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said, I assure you, it wasn't Moses who gave the bread from heaven to you, but my father who gives the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, sir, give me this bread all the time. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I told you that you, that you have seen me and still don't believe. Everyone whom the Father gives to me will come to me, and I won't send away anyone who comes from me. Jesus is the bread of life. But what he's talking about here, again, it's not feeding just our physical bodies, but the word for life that's being used in this passage is that third definition that we had, zoe. And it's that soul life, that eternal life, that divine life that's uniquely possessed by God. And so when Jesus is saying he's feeding us life, it's not just for our physical bodies, but it is the true presence of God in our midst. And that's what we celebrate when we come to the table for Holy Communion. When Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life, those who eat will never go hungry. He is living water, those who drink will never go thirsty. When we come to approach the table of God, Jesus is offering himself to us in that way so that we can feel God's presence in our midst and be, to be with us in whatever we're facing, wherever we go. So when we think about life and what it means, here in this passage, it is eternal, it is divine, it is a gift from God that's open to each and every one of us. I know that many of you are joining us online, um, but I also want to stress the importance, too, of being able to be in community from time to time, especially to come to the table and partake of Holy Communion. Because every time we do, we remember that it's Jesus who's calling people to himself, that Jesus is the one who sets that altar, who invites us to eat and drink, and to remember that not only do we receive forgiveness of our sins, sins through communion, but we also experience the power of God in our lives to transform us. We are brought ever closer to our Lord through communion. And so as we think about all of the ways that we experience life in Christ from the beginning to the end, as we share life together as God's people, we cannot forget that it's not only our physical lives, that bios, or our soul life, that shuka, but also the zoe, the divine life that is eternal with God. And it's a gift for each and every one of us. May God bless you this week as you go forward experiencing life in Christ. Amen.